Well, thank you for that introduction. A good design, be it smart, sustainable, sensible, all three, is now a key quality in the um, competitive space of global cities. And Sydney, Australia has realised that. This paper looks at just one element of how that has become uh, embedded in the approval process, and in particular an aspect which is comparing alternatives to come up with the best solution. While competitions have been a um, long uh, part of the architecture industry, and certainly bob up frequently for major public buildings and spaces, here we're seeing that idea applied within a legal, statutory land use planning system to private uh, finance development. So this is a peek into the ecology of city centre decision-making, something of the dark side, if you like, over the last day. It's the downtown neoliberal world of big actors and global capital and multi-million dollar developments. And I'm focusing on how one uh, central city authority has tried to rein in some of these pressures and secure a public interest dividend. This work uh, from an ongoing research project is set within four primary intersecting niches. One is the global city in the age of neoliberalism, the rise of advanced producer services, branding, inner city competition, and productivity as a major planning goal. Secondly, the nexus between urban design and public policy is much about governance as aesthetics, harking back to Barnett's classic work. Thirdly, the, inst uh, the installation of design excellence, as a mantra in city making, and fourthly, the role of competitive processes as a mechanism for securing that. These four broader issues then intersect with two interdependent local narratives for Sydney. One is the rise of the design ethos, especially urban design in central Sydney from a crude post-war zoning paradigm of the 1950s, you see there illustrated on the plan, through to the first strategic uh, document from as late as 1971, but from which so much has flowed since. And, and the second kind of local narrative is the transformation of Sydney into a global city. Um, first comprehended in the 1990s, uh, the report uh, at left on screen, and then moving into the DNA of the city's current planning strategy. The Global Sydney in focus here is essentially the Sydney high-rise CBD, Australia's major financial centre and home to many global businesses. And the major planning authority here is the Sydney City Council, which has a jurisdiction of only 25 square kilometres, which is the CBD and the immediately surrounding suburbs. Here's the dimensions of that area, and the star at the top marks the central business uh, area. The coloured splotches are essentially those parts of the territory that have been excised from the control of the council by the state government of New South Wales. These are primarily uh, big uh, uh, urban renewal areas. So the lighter blue shaded area is governed by the Sydney Local Environmental Plan, which is the major legal document. Uh, and there are a complementary set of development control plans or DCPs. So operative within that star zone since 2000 and within the broader blue bounded area by since 2012 is a competitive design policy. This is an unusual if not unique uh, protocol because it mandates that competitive practices need to be part of the development application process. And its origins lie in the 1990s as the convergence of several factors. One, the growing awareness of uh, the value-added benefits of design. Secondly, the events propelling Sydney into a global profile, particularly the Olympics of 2000. Uh, thirdly, the replacement from sort of machine big city politics by uh, independent community-based politicians. Uh, the drive to make Sydney a more livable 24-7 city, a process that looked 
for exemplars abroad, including uh, Vancouver. And finally, a more local issue, the perception that uh, control of commissions for central Sydney uh, architecture was being dominated by a small cartel of, of big firms. So the policy um, doesn't apply to all development. Uh, the criteria here are limiting it to big buildings, big floor uh, print uh, buildings and uh, those costing uh, a significant amount of uh, uh, dollars. The policy comes with bonuses for the developer and so it has their attention and uh, upwards of 10% of, of floor space if their project successfully goes through the hoops of a competition is quite a, a significant carrot for the developer. What is design excellence is captured in the local environmental plan. It's essentially high quality architectural design contributing to a, a high quality a public realm and there's a whole series of uh, uh, bullet points there including ecologically sustainable development. There are several different types of competition uh, processes, fully open, um, invited competitions, preparation of design alternatives. And here the similarities and differences are, are summarised. The design alternatives processes uh, only make available um, a bonus in terms of height and floor space, not the uh, historic um, transfer. Another key difference is that the open competitions and, um, uh, have juries that include a variety of different players, whereas the design alternatives option uh, has a jury that's chosen by the developer. Uh, although increasingly that process is having community observers as part of the process, or at least council sanctioned observers. One way or the other, it plays out into a forum like this. Sydney has a, a two-stage development application process. So the first stage is mainly about bulk, floor space, uh, height. Uh, uh, and the second stage is a much more detailed design. So the competitive process is uh, intended to get uh, the best option that could be developed into a more detailed stage two DA. The juries produce reports like this, which are very hard to get, which I'll, I'll come on to. And they illustrate and describe and explain and critique uh, the, the, uh, the different alternatives from which a scheme is finally selected. This doesn't capture everything, this policy. Um, but over the last decade and a half, there have been over 40 major projects in the CBD uh, that have been uh, included. Uh, currently, there are 12 projects going through this process, a significant spike in activity coming after the recession of the uh, global financial crisis. They're all through the central city, uh, but with mixed-use developments uh, dominating. Some statistics for the projects that we at least have uh, details for, and there's a large range of variability here in terms of scale and some of those averages are being skewed by uh, mega projects. But the key figures here are in the right hand column. Um, this policy has captured over a million uh, square metres of floor space uh, and projects totalling over five billion dollars. So our research has mixed up uh, uh, and explored more intensively that quantitative, uh, quantitative side of things uh, which is harder than it looked. Uh, and also with uh, qualitative interviews of, uh, of key stakeholders summarised here. And so what I wanted to do was just to, uh, in fact, distill the essence of that into the, uh, the, the pluses that seem to be attached to this policy and some of the minuses. I'll start with the pluses. Firstly, there was a general view coming from our interviewees that this process had raised the level of design debate uh, and design quality, and certainly by our estimate of 25 completed projects by the start of 2015, 17 had won some sort of professional award. The process is increasing participation of a wide range of uh, architectural firms. Uh, more international firms are moving into the market, but also more 
uh, progressive and innovative smaller firms, part of the original rationale of the policy. Uh, over more than a decade, the developers uh, seem to be more and more warming to the scheme, particularly given that they can get this 10% floor space bonus, well, which is a, a terrific uh, carrot for them. Um, fourthly, neoliberalism is a, is a marketization process, and so it's created a new market here for planning firms to come in and manage the whole process for various developers. Um, it promotes earlier interaction between the development side of the um, process and the regulatory side of the process. Uh, and, and, and therefore, it's a much more um, proactive intervention into development approval. And, 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 and finally, it's certainly propelled local government into the whole process of, uh, of globalisation. On the um, other hand, there were concerns that surfaced in our uh, discussions. Time is money for developers, and this process adds costs, and it adds months to securing a DA, and there's no certainty that the developer will actually get uh, the full 10% floor space or height bonus. Uh, while developers are potentially uh, rewarded, there can be only one architect winner. They do take away fees from participating in these processes. Four, or four to six firms will be competing against each other but they invariably incur more costs than, they, um, than they're remunerated for, uh, and they're complaining about that, uh, especially given that it's a, a mandatory statutory process. Um, thirdly, there's been concern that the, the council has um, uh, played favourites with some of the architects that have been chosen. And fourthly, intersecting with a major theme of this conference, is the concern that uh, these processes are hidden from, from, from public view. They're done by experts behind closed doors and there's no real public buy-in. Uh, and, and so here, I'm, in my second last slide, I'm just speculating on, on why that could be. The first quotation there will be of, of, of concern to this audience. There's a sense that by public getting more exposure to what's going on, um, good decision-making will be uh, uh, derailed. But there's also concern that uh, if this stuff is published, commercial and confidence information will be released. Uh, and thirdly, there's a concern that uh, on the part of some of the participating architects that some of the intellectual property and design will be exposed uh, before, it's, before they get a chance to really uh, uh, implement it. So my final slide. Major conclusions. This seems to be a unique regime in Australia, certainly. Um, is it worldwide? Uh, I'd certainly be uh, welcome input on that. Secondly, the designer uh, director of the, of the council has said that uh, this is a, a closing the gap mechanism between private capital and, and, and public interest, and there seems some evidence for that. But thirdly, it's, it, it's sort of rarefying urban design into the uh, realm of, uh, of experts uh, behind closed doors. Uh, it's hitched to the top end of town with these kind of triggers for, for bonuses. And finally, when I kind of look sort of conceptually at this, what we've got here is an archetypal neoliberal policy for our time. It's institutionalising competitiveness in a competitive world where the major driver is the carrot of economic reward. So thank you very much.